let me be one of the first to welcome you to 2021 and a new episode of Crime After Crime. Hey everyone, I'm John Lorden. And it is me, Daniel Hallen, and welcome to the new year. I've been waiting forever to say it. (laughs) <laughs> yes, we did it. We did it. We are in 2021. We're so happy that you guys are here. The Crime After Crime family, all of us together. New topic, two new stories. Mm-hmm. You guys tell us which one you like more. We're going to just keep this thing going and we're going to keep doing this all throughout 2021. Keep battling it out. Head to Absolutely. Head. Competition. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one punch after the other. <laughs> And with this new year, we also have a brand new sponsor for today's video. Did you know that there are rewards all over your home? It's time for you to bust out those detective skills and find them with Fetch. Fetch is an easy to use phone app that will take your shopping and restaurant receipts and turn them into points that you can use for real rewards. Just take a quick snapshot of your receipt using the Fetch app, earn points and get great rewards. Gift cards from major retailers like Best Buy, Target, and The Home Depot are just a small sample of what you can get with Fetch Points. You can earn even more points by purchasing products featured on Fetch. What about your digital receipts? Fetch can use those for points too. You'll be racking up those points and getting that reward from Amazon, Visa, Starbucks. The list is huge and you get to choose. I was even able to make a donation using my points to the American Cancer Society. Check out the link in the description. Use the code Crime After Crime and get 4,000 points, $4 value when you scan your first receipt. That's right. Download the app now and use the code Crime After Crime to get 4,000 points worth $4 when you scan your first receipt. Have fun, earn rewards, and help support Crime After Crime. Use the link below and sign up for Fetch right now. That's right. Start having fun. Exactly. I know. I'm kind of excited. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. going to gather up so many points from Home Depot. <laughs> it's fun it's like a little going on <laughs> yeah it's like a, it's like a little slot machine and all of a sudden <laughs> hey i got points oh wow look i've mm, now i can buy something exactly. or go lord and art style make a donation yeah know, thank you I guys awesome i think I, I was really blown away by that and honestly i think that's really really cool so big thank you to fetch for sponsoring today's episode And now we're going to get to it, right into it. It's time for voting results with Danielle for the last episode, Yuletide Crimes. Danielle, what happened? All right. First of all, that was an awesome episode. I absolutely loved that one. And I love Mm -hmm. that we both found a really cool way to give back. Um, But voting wise, on Twitter, I received 54% of the vote and John received 46%. And then on the website, it was pretty much the exact same. That's really, really close. Yeah. 55% for me and 45% to John, bringing season three totals to three episodes for me and one for John. Oh, Danielle, we've been here before. We have been. We've been here before, but I don't know. You might be able to extend this stretch. And if you do... That's... I'm gonna have to do something. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to like call in a pinch hitter. Like I'm gonna have like You're gonna have Stephanie to send Harlow. More flies in. Yeah, I'm gonna have like <laughs> Stephanie Harlow show up, or I'm gonna consult with Mike Morford, Stephanie Harlow, John Crimes. We're all gonna get together and write my episode in secret and not tell you, and then I'm gonna deliver it and just take credit. Oh my god, okay, um, there we go. <laughs> it almost hurts more when the when the score is this close. I was so close, Danielle. Was. I was so close. I, I'm honestly, I kind of figured it was going to be close, though, because we both brought yeah. just, I, I thought we both brought, brought really good stories and really good causes. And I mean, how can you, I know I personally would have a really hard time choosing. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think uh, I think you guys are in for another episode like that today. Yep. Got a couple more good stories. Mm-hmm. But of course, with that, there would be a cup exchange right now. But since Danielle's so busy winning everything, we don't get to do, yeah, we don't get to do our cool little YouTube magic trick where she hands me the cup. So Danielle, Uh, I want you to impress us somehow. I might be able to conjure up my own magic. I've watched enough Harry Potter movies at this point. I feel like I've got a handle on this. So let's see if I can make that coffee cup disappear. (gasps) Oh! Whoa, the logo changed. That is the new Crime After Crime Jail Tat logo on your cup. Wow, look at that. So fancy. I'm telling you, magic skills on 100% today. (laughs) I did a great job. (laughs) So Danielle just completed the cup exchange with herself. Perfect. Um, (laughs) Honestly, and it still didn't go as smooth 
as I was hoping. <laughs> How does that happen? Well, good. Now we know who to blame the next time we do a real one and it doesn't go well. It's okay. I'll take it. I'll take the blame. All right. On to today's episode, craziest hiding place. So just to give you guys a little context around this, this can be a place where the criminal is hidden. Could also be a place where loot is hidden. There's all kinds of different ways to look at this. It just has to be connected to a crime. And with that, we are starting, of course, ladies first and winner first. Winner of season one, season two, going on a mad streak of three and one for season three. Until the death flies come. <laughs> where is where is my evil little death flies? Danielle Hallen. All right, you guys. I don't know if you can tell, if you're watching the YouTube version of this, you probably can. My level of excitement is through the roof. Now, this uh -oh. story, this is a good one to bring in the new year with, that's for sure. And dare I even say, it is up there with DBTuber. Whoa. Like, it's, Th I'm honestly thinking it may blow, I mean, no pun intended, but DBTuber out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, no way. I'm so serious. I was shocked to find the story because, first of all, it's local to me. And somehow I've never heard the story. And also, it's, you know, kind of a part of this year. It happened around this time. And, you know, I'm just excited. I think I'm going to get it. But also, I do have to say a huge shout out to Israel Keys because I wanted to cover him and his murder caches. That's like, to me, the hiding places of all hiding places. He's got murder caches stored all everywhere i mean probably mm -hmm. through canada up in alaska it's insane but i figured i'd leave that one already touched on that before but i had to mention him because i'm just so bewildered by that serial killer but yeah the story today between 1998 and 2000 mcdonald's restaurants across the country were all having the same problem with someone they referred to as the roof men starting in california mcdonald's left and right were being robbed by someone who seemed to think that he was in a mission impossible movie <laughs> Late at night, as most McDonald's were gearing down for the night shift or closing, a secret intruder would cut a small human-sized hole in the roof and lower himself down on unsuspecting employees. Now, he was typically never violent. He hardly even raised his voice. He calmly would tell the employees to put on their jackets so that they would be warm and the freezer that he was, you know, about to herd them into. So I guess, I guess when it comes to criminals, it kind of makes him <laughs> all right. <laughs> I mean, it's better than putting them in there without a jacket, it that's sure for sure. Is. It sure is. Yeah. <laughs> After this, the roofman would go on about his business at the same business repeatedly. Every single McDonald's. A spokesperson for McDonald's even said that the roofman was just a very brand loyal person trying to make a joke out of this odd criminal. But he was applauded for his MO. He would jump cities so that authorities and employees were never really expecting it. But he was always able to rely on the consistency of the store's layout and protocols to get him from start to finish flawlessly. All of his victims spoke about how calm and kind he was despite what he was attempting to do, and there were only really a handful of robberies where he did get a little violent. He would kind of fire off gunshots as warning shots when employees were uncooperative. There was one time where it wasn't necessarily violent, but he narrowly escaped authorities in 1998. It was actually on Christmas Eve. He jumped off of the roof of the building to run, but he was just someone that left everyone baffled. Now, this thief eventually realized that he wanted to move on to something bigger and better. He knew that McDonald's was just kind of like a smaller version of larger box stores that also had consistent layouts and consistent protocols lining up with his methods. However, as we all know, this greed eventually led to his demise. Mm. After two years and 40 separate robberies, most of which being McDonald's, 32-year-old Jeffrey Manchester was arrested in Gaston County, North Carolina on May 21st, 2000. Now, his history was really unremarkable for the most part. He graduated in 1991 from Rancho Cordova High School in California before entering into the U.S. Army Reserves. However, in the Army Reserves, he was known for having skills in regards to spatial patterns. So basically, he would analyze spatial formulas and repeating events among businesses, therefore creating these predictable loops mm -hmm. that he was able to work around. It was pretty much the perfect scheme, but he ended up being sentenced to 45 years in prison for his nationwide crime spree and was sent to serve his time in Brown Creek Correctional Institution. So already this man's on one, okay? Yeah. While there, he made his way up to working in the metal shop based off of good behavior. But this wasn't for brownie points. As usual, he had a plan behind it. 
Many trucks came through to this area every day to drop off supplies for the prison and to pick up metal parts that they would create in the shop. I think they created like kitchen appliances. Mm -hmm. And he used his special set of skills to track the shift changes of the guards. Pretty much any detail that he could, their typical walking patterns, he would see the times that the trucks made deliveries. And from there, he planned to escape the prison using one of the delivery trucks. He decided that on a rainy day, that would be probably the best day because the guards, you know, they use that area to check the deliveries coming in and to make sure that nothing unapproved came out. And he was hoping that the rain would hopefully throw off the dogs so that his escape would go undetected. And he even made a small platform out of a piece of plywood because he had access to the shop, right? And he spray painted it black and he built it so it could quite literally pop in place under the truck. So he wow. could sandwich himself in so that from the bottom, it looked like the bottom of the car right. and no one would see him. And it's interesting because to this day, no one really knows if he sneakily made measurements of a car or if this was just a really good guess because of his spatial awareness. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. So once that rainy day came on June 16th, 2004, Jeffrey climbed underneath a delivery truck that was about to head off of prison grounds and held on for dear life. And he ended up becoming the first ever person to escape from Brown Creek Correctional Facility. Wow. So from there, Jeffrey went a few counties over to Mecklenburg County. So this is the Charlotte area of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Authorities ended up being given a tip off on his location, thanks to two separate residents that gave him a ride when they saw him hitchhiking. Later on, these residents were alarmed when they watched the news and saw this same man's escape. And again, he was so polite and kind of quiet and calm that they were shocked that they had just been transporting someone who had just escaped from prison. Now, his choice of location was questioned later on. A lot of people believed that he would likely flee either back to California or at the very least much further away. But again, he always had a plan for everything. And he chose that location on purpose, despite it being only a few counties over. Now, during his research before his escape, many inmates had informed him that Mecklenburg County had the most lenient penalties for burglary. And that was his plan coming out of prison, so it was the perfect place to be. Authorities immediately labeled him as possibly armed and dangerous and said that since he was obviously very low on cash, that he would likely go back to his roots to get some. But he ended up evading arrest for six months by hiding. That Now, we've heard enough stories about people that escape from mm -hmm. jail and... Most of the time, they're recaptured within a matter of hours, yep. at the most a matter of days, yep. but like <laughs> literally like one or two days, but never a matter of months. I mean, that's that's an insane feat. Six months. Wow. I know. So Jeffrey figured the best way to hide would be in plain sight for the most part. He assimilated into the community by attending a local church under the name of John. Mm -hmm. Making new friends at this church, he was volunteering, and he was pretty much fooling everyone. He was very well known for giving toys to kids in need. I mean, you're, it was approaching the holiday season, but he was even doing that beforehand. Yeah. And according to those that got to know him, they said that he was an overall respectable guy. He never caused issues, and he seemed very genuine. But nobody had any idea, like not even the slightest idea that he was an escaped convict. And... That has a lot to do with the fact that people didn't really ask any questions. Upon John's arrival, <laughs> he had informed all of his new friends that he worked a secret job for the government. Okay. So that was kind of his way of getting people to not question him. They took his yeah. kindness in stride. But while all of that was going well, he still needed somewhere to hide more permanently. Obviously, renting a home or an apartment was out of the question because he didn't want to have his name traced to anything. Faking your you know, identification, that's kind of like another really large crime on what he already had going on. And it costs a lot of money that he didn't have. And that would be difficult. So he basically decided to live out every kid's dream. He decided to live in a Toys R Us. Hide in a Toys R Us. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, John, where did you think all of the donated toys came from? Well, he's calling himself John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, like, if I had to hide somewhere, Danielle, it's a good, it's a good place to choose. Do you think I would hide in a <laughs> Toys R Us <laughs> with my little Toyota? Um, probably, <laughs> I would assume so. And there's plenty of video games. Oh my God, are you kidding me? You're yeah, sad. I mean, it's, 
in terms of entertainment, you know, I'd be waiting for it to close and be like, oh, I'd be like the gremlin, you know, running around playing with stuff in the middle of the night. But you'd think you're also leaving traces behind, you know, like, are they going to notice that certain things are going missing wow. or that, hey, this door's still open? He was or... a very smart guy. He was a very Seems smart like guy. It. So yeah. basically, Jeffrey scoped out the local store. And he found that he could easily create a space to hide. And this, like, gives my childhood, like, my hiding space. I feel very confident in it now. But he hid behind the bicycle rack. <laughs> it, but isn't, I'm being serious, though. It wasn't that, like, everyone's favorite place to hide when you're in a store. And you're like, huh, I'm going to trick my parents. And, like, you, yeah. like, crawl behind the bicycle rack. Yeah, because it was huge. Exactly. I mean, it was probably the biggest mm -hmm. display structure in the store, especially the old format of the store. Oh, it was yeah. not where they went to the new, like, um, wagon wheel kind of mm -hmm. format. But, yeah. Yeah, it was – I mean, it was near the back of the store. It wasn't yeah. frequently visited in comparison to other sections. You know, it's kind of something you don't just go in and browse at. Mm -hmm. um, he would slip behind the bikes and kind of burrow himself into the wall, slowly working every day to make his spot more of a secret. Once security would shut down the store for the day, he would then do what John said he would do. And he had the time of his life. <laughs> he would take RC cars up to the roof and race them around. I mean, he had a thing with the roof, so I guess old dad habits die hard. He yeah. would ride the bikes around the aisles. He, when he could, <laughs> I know. When he couldn't afford to eat at the Red Lobster nearby, which was apparently his choice of meal, he would actually swipe food from the baby store or the baby aisle section for his dinner. Oh, that's right. I can't imagine that'd be very tasty, in there. but it is like an endless supply of food. Oh, it can't be bad. What was it? Applesauce? Yeah. Delicious. <laughs> Great. The banana one, I literally ate baby banana food forever because I thought it was just so good. <laughs> <laughs> but during the day, he would resume his honorable activities in the community and even manage to snag a girlfriend. This is how convincing this man was. Was her name Barbie? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> surprisingly no i mean i can see absolutely i can see where you get that <laughs> but he met a woman named lee wainscott through the church during volunteer work and they hit it off mm. lee said and i quote he was a very well-spoken well-dressed clean and generous man there were no red flags she didn't notice that he was wearing an orange vest that had a picture of a giant giraffe oh on the my back. Goodness. Could you imagine? Why do you always wear that vest? I know. I mean, it's nice, but can't you wear something else? Oh, wait, but then that just makes me think too. I'm like, man, where is he showering? Yeah. Well, you know, if you have a bathroom there, you can you can kind of just use the sink, I guess. <laughs> but he also had a few more tricks up his sleeve that I'll get into. Uh oh no! But his master plan was approaching. He intended on acting out a robbery in the Toys R Us right after Christmas. So okay. I mean, always, always a bigger plan here. He yeah. was hoping that this would get him money to make bigger moves. He wanted to, you know, get out and go somewhere. When the holiday shopping picked up, however, he kind of realized there was a threat to his privacy. With so many people in and out of the store. I mean, bikes are a pretty big gift for Christmas. He knew yeah. he needed to up his game. So he began to burrow deeper into the wall and eventually found himself on the other side of the wall under a staircase in the neighboring building, which happened to be an abandoned circuit city. Okay. So once he was there, he made himself a four by 10 room for himself under the stairs. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a good size. Yeah, it was pretty large. I mean, it was yeah. fully decorated. He had stolen Spider-Man posters covering the walls. He <laughs> took a bed from Toys R Us. He put Spider-Man sheets on that bed. Um, he had a basketball hoop for entertainment as well as a television with all the DVDs you could ever need. There were action figures <laughs> and other toys. I mean, he was having the time of his life. You just described my office. Exactly. <laughs> He was, exactly. See, he's having the time of his life. You're like, I love that. I know. <laughs> but obviously, all these items came from Toys R Us. He even installed a smoke detector and a fire extinguisher because, hello, I mean, safety laws, right? You have to abide yeah. by those. Other laws, apparently not so much. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, I guess for choosing. Um, but he also yeah. piped in water. Whoa, he got plumbing going he did. too? He piped in water from the Toys R Us and he piped it into a diaper bin that he turned into a makeshift toilet. Uh, I was just going to, I literally had this picture in my mind of them going, like employees showing up, going to the bathroom saying, why is there a toilet missing? Mm -hmm. But he no, he made gone. it. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I mean, he he had a pretty good setup there. But what is a good hideout without good security? So Jeffrey had a plan for that as well. He had already been using baby monitors in the store to keep an eye on employees. But he grabbed a handful more to set up all around his little hole to make sure things were secure. He also ended up using these baby monitors to start prepping his robbery plan. So what he would do is he tracked the shifts of employees, the employees' behaviors. He would track the customer's typical movements in the store. I mean, all of his formulas that he would kind of create in his head. And the predictability easily allowed him access to where the money was kept, when the money was put away, who typically put it away, how vigilant security was. And this is when he realized that while he was fully capable of robbing the store based on the mechanics already in place, he also at this point realized that he could himself create the perfect scenario. This realization led him to getting into their own security system. He started to keep note of which security guards seemed incompetent or uncaring, which managers Mm -hmm. and employees would be easiest to work with in his plan. And he went in and rearranged the entire schedule to fit his needs. So he basically found all the ways in which he could slowly dismantle their entire system to create these blind spots. Yeah. And he's doing all of this from his comfortable 4x10 fully decorated Spider-Man suite and the staircase <laughs> of the Circuit City after he <laughs> dug a hole in the wall of the Toys R Us bike rack. Well, and I, I just, my brain is now stuck on this toilet thing. This guy is You're such like, a genius. <laughs> yeah, no, he's such a genius at figuring out all this stuff and how he's going to rob, but he couldn't figure out the times where he could get away, like to get to the public restroom that's in the Toys R Us well, or... Isn't there a restroom in the Circuit City? Like he had to make his own toilet. <laughs> I know. And that's that's what I was thinking too, because I'm like, the Circuit City is abandoned. But like, yeah, I mean, there's definitely restrooms in it. And he had to have been using something for a while. He didn't immediately build this. Yeah. You know? And so I don't know. Maybe yeah. it was just like a way of him trying to like lower the risk of being caught potentially. Or maybe he's right. just like, hey, I'm bored today. Let's just fully put some water lines in. <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of feel like that, too. I kind of feel like it was a, just a challenge, just something to engineer for him. Yeah, because yeah. his brain seemed to always be going. But, yeah. you know, once all of his plan was laid out and ready for the robbery, mm-hmm. he also went to a local pawn shop and got a gun. Um, from then, he jumped into action. On December 26, 2005, Jeffrey had planned a time where there would be no guards or managers on duty at the same time. So it left only a few basic employees. Like he quite literally went in and like redid the entire schedule. (laughs) And I'm like, how did nobody notice that? But anyways, (laughs) Jeffrey ended up cornering two of the very basic employees, notifying them of his intentions and expected them to act accordingly. But both of them said they were not paid enough to deal with his shenanigans and basically ran away. Hmm. So to add to this, an off-duty sheriff also just happened to stop by in the middle of the heist. So the plans were basically just not going the way that he expected. And Jeffrey got so thrown off that he decided escape was the only option left. So clearly, the most rational thing to do was to punch the off-duty deputy, steal her gun, and then run as fast as you can. Oh, my goodness. But guess what? It worked. What the heck? He got away. So the two employees that he initially tried to get in on his little plan ended up calling authorities to alert them of the situation. You know, the off-duty deputy is being cared for. I'm sure she called someone. Um, Mm -hmm. And eventually, authorities showed up. Now, Jeffrey was long gone at this point, but they decided to still do a large search of the store just in case, as well as the abandoned circuit city next door, because that'd be a pretty quick and easy way to hide. And they started to connect the dots when they began to do this. Now, there had apparently been a prior issue in relation to both the Toys R Us and the Circuit City. A few times recently, alarms had gone off, indicating there had been a break-in during the early morning hours at the Toys R Us, but nothing Mm -hmm. was ever found when authorities arrived, and the door that was triggered was one that was connected to Circuit City. So it could have been either, but it was clearly someone entering into Toys R Us. Yeah. Ultimately, at the time, they ended up blaming it on a rodent somehow tripping the system, but they started to realize, you know, we've had more items than usual go missing. We've had a few things out of place. So they started to wonder if the criminal they were looking for had either been in the building the whole time or just, you know, was coming in freely in the morning and had attempted this a few other times. Right. Authorities in their search managed to find a single screw that appeared to be holding up a piece of the wall. In Toys R Us. When they unscrewed it, it fell to the ground, revealing another trap door, which, by the way, was spring-loaded with a bungee cord. Yeah. Taken from Toys R Us. And this (laughs) 
opened up to Circuit City. So they searched this small area and they found almost $7,000 in toys stuffed into the ceiling tiles. So he had stashes all over, <laughs> basically. And But what was the plan? Like, was he eventually going to remove those toys? I have no to... idea. I don't think, I don't know if he was slowly pulling them out and stashing them in hopes of reselling them because we know he was also just giving them away to right. kids through the church. But is he just like, it feels like he's just pretending that he's robbing. Like, oh, yeah. I'm going to go and rob. Like, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. It's so weird. I'm, wow. I mean, but I mean, it, that was just like his entrance, though, unfortunately. So they found all of this stuff and they're like, this is the most bizarre thing. Yeah. But it didn't lead them to his hideaway yet. So authorities ended up coming back a few days later, unsure of what to think. Um, and they decided to check the Circuit City side again, just in case. And they ended up finding a similar board held up by a screw on one of the walls. And this time when they opened it up, you can imagine their shock when they find this four by ten decked out bedroom. <laughs> Right. I mean, luxury Looks amenities. Looks like it's stuck out for a kid. Yeah. <laughs> luxury <laughs> amenities. I mean. Spider-Man everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Authorities were able to do some forensics on the room and they were able to lift a fingerprint and obviously he'd been in prison before. So it confirmed it was prison escapee Jeffrey Manchester. So mm. they also had already put out his photo on the news, um, the photo from like the little clip they found on security to gather tips in order to locate this person. Two members of the church ended up coming forward saying that this random man <laughs> claiming to be named John had shown up at their church and matched the photos, but they were kind of shocked because, again, they thought he was a great guy. Yeah. They also ended up being contacted by a local dentist who claimed to have just done work on Jeffrey's teeth. And ironically... Shortly after the Toys R Us incident, the dentist office went up in flames and burned mm. to the ground. So it was Whoa. believed at this point that that was done to prevent Jeffrey's records from being found. So he was, now that he realized someone was onto him, he was trying to take everything away right, that he could be right. connected to. It wow. came out through the church that Jeffrey also had a girlfriend, and that's where authority should start. But Lee was also shocked. She didn't believe at all what authorities were saying. She initially said that Jeffrey wasn't capable of this and that they were accusing him of something that he would never do. The whole church loved him. He had just gifted her diamond earrings. But eventually she agreed to cooperate in a sting operation after they showed her proof. It was her 40th birthday that was coming up and she invited Jeffrey over for a small celebration. Now, authorities already knew this was kind of a chance because they were almost positive he would be gone at this point. It had been 10 days since this entire fiasco. But surprisingly... He showed up to the party, obviously wasn't met with his birthday girl. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, he was met with police. Now, Jeffrey ended up going willingly. He even managed to call Lee and he did respectfully break up with her, <laughs> <laughs> saying that he was very sad and very humbled and that he felt terrible that he had to deceive everyone. And it got to this point. And he also called his mom saying that he had gotten a little lost and made a mistake. Jeffrey ended up being faced with six felony charges. Robbery with a dangerous weapon, malicious use of explosives, breaking and entering, possession of a firearm by a felon, and burning in an occupied building. Authorities also, which this is my favorite part about all of this because it also ties in someone other than Israel Keys and I'm very fascinated by, um, but they went through all of his behavioral files from his stay at the correctional facility and they mm -hmm. found that he was obsessed with hidden doors, rooms, and hallways. And he yeah. had all of these different books where he would frequently map out plans of what he would call his dream home. And it basically resembled H.H. Holmes' murder castle. Yeah. yeah. I mean, tons of rooms within walls. There were trap doors, secret entrances. Every room was connected in some way. So he was clearly drawn to this sort of thing, like kind of hiding in secret his like Mission Impossible entrance into all of his robberies. I just found that part really fascinating. But information from this point on isn't really in any article. They kind of stopped talking about him after this. So I'm very mm -hmm. thankful that North Carolina makes searching up prison records and charges very easy. Yeah. So on October 13th, 2005, he was in fact convicted of all of the offenses in connection with the failed robbery. And it's also interesting because he had charges of robbery with a dangerous weapon and second degree kidnapping and felony breaking and entering from late November of 2004. So like a month before he was captured. 
That's weird. But I don't know how, I don't know what exactly happened. I can't seem to find any information about it, but clearly the he, I mean, he was committing all sorts of crimes and it makes you question how many more that they just haven't connected him to. Yeah. I, well, I wonder if the charges related to his attempt at the robbery yeah. in some way. Cause you know, if you force someone to into a room and you say you can't leave from here and you're yeah. holding a weapon, I mean, that could could ring up, I think, as a kidnapping charge. Yeah. I don't know. That's really that's really yeah. weird. But I also there's kind of this aspect to it where it it sounds like he's really brilliant in one way, but he's got some mental challenge going on yeah. in another way. Yeah. Like the the compulsiveness to just have to steal. For him mm -hmm. to figure out this whole mechanism of finding a place to live where he has evaded the cops for six months, yep. but then to risk that for a score, like there's just, it's really, really, I don't know. There's there's something where it's like, it seems, you think he's really smart one way and really not the other. It seems to me, I mean, he knows he's really smart. I think he yeah. really does. But I think he's just, it's like almost like an adrenaline junkie. Like I feel like he knows yeah. he's smart and he doesn't care how he uses it because he wants to use it. And the way where it gets him excited. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's yeah. almost to me what it seems like. I don't, because when he's captured, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, when even when he was robbing McDonald's, he wasn't mm -hmm. ever aggressive. I mean, it was never to be, you know, rough or anything. I don't even know what he bought with the money. I don't know. You know, there's usually something behind it. But it yeah. seems like he just pushed boundaries just to see if he could do it. And that's what made him excited. Well, and I also think it's pretty interesting I know you keep drawing it to uh, a comparison with Mission Impossible, but then for him to have all that imagery of Spider-Man around yeah, too, obviously exactly. he had a thing about that, like coming in from the ceiling exactly. aspect. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. But guess what? On January 31st, 2009, guess what he tried to do? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. He had a secret place in the jail. He tried to escape from room. prison again. He no. did. He did. He tried again. He wasn't going to give up. I'm telling you. He just wants to see how many times I think he could accomplish something and how far he can push it. Yeah. Now, he ended up serving time for those three unrelated charges from November, a month before he was captured. Um, he served for those until 2013. And then he began serving time for the portion or just a small portion of the Toys R Us charges, which mm -hmm. he will be released from in 2021. But then he will start serving for the rest of his charges from Toys R Us, including the robbery with a dangerous weapon, possession of a firearm by a felon. And that will go until 2026. Wow. Now, I don't know what exactly they did. Oh, oh, also the attempted escapes, the two so far, um, projected release date of 2036. So it'll definitely be till 2036. However, Whew. I don't know what they did about the fact that he was originally serving 45 years. Mm. I don't know if they're going to tack that on at the end. I'm not sure how exactly that works, but I, I thought it was interesting. And, you know, just when you thought it's over, it's not. He had numerous convictions while still in prison, ranging from weapon possession, battering to possession of audio video imaging devices, which I can only assume were to escape again. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm probably yeah. not wrong because then on October 30th, 2017, he did escape again. <laughs> But he was recaptured, and his latest charge in prison is substance possession from April of this year, and that was immediately following his charges for disobeying orders and damaging state property. So he's just something else. And even Officer Fred Allen, the cop who ended up finding his hiding spot, said, and I quote, I've never seen anybody so determined. He wasn't going to make a stupid mistake. We had to find him. And authorities have stated since then, you know, he paid for his dental work. He bought these diamond earrings. They say he's definitely robbed numerous businesses of thousands and thousands of dollars. And we just haven't connected the dots. Um, and they also stated at, right after they captured him after the Toys R Us incident that they strongly believed he would try to escape again, which we know he did. <laughs> but now I'm yeah. just going to start taking bets from everyone. When do you think he'll do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I mean, <laughs> no, it, it's a game to him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to keep trying. Uh, and probably at this point, because he's been in jail so long, it's probably more comfortable for him to be there playing this game oh, yeah. than to be out and free. Because even when he's out and free, he's still drumming up games to play against society. So, wow. Exactly. And a huge thank you to Ranker, The Daily Beast, The Seattle Times, and Star News Online for all of this information. 
Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Interesting story, Danielle. The Toys Man. R Us wall. <sighs> Hiding out in a Toys R Us. Uh, and his name is John. I swear. It's it's uh, it's like another <laughs> life, another dimension where I have gone rogue. <laughs> Well, we have another story to tell you, but first we've got to take this quick and short break. Simplify your life and cut out stressful meal planning with HelloFresh. Their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door with step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients. Everything that I need to pull off a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. With more than 20 recipes featured every week, you will never get bored. Last week, I put my cooking skills to the test by making a tomato mushroom risotto. But with HelloFresh's amazing instructions, it was easy and tasted just like it came right from the restaurant. It was awesome. Starting the new year with some new health goals, maybe? Eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options. Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. And with the new year, HelloFresh is giving our listeners the best deal yet. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash one zero crime after crime and use code one zero crime after crime for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Pressed for time, check out their easy eats menu with meals that are ready in 10 to 20 minutes. My personal favorites. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash one zero crime after crime and use code one zero crime after crime for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Try HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit today. After years of having my wife read signs for me and tell me I really needed to get glasses, I finally did it. I went to one of those big companies and spent a small fortune on my first pair. It's great being able to see again. I just wish I didn't see that my wallet took such a hit. Don't make the same mistake John did. Check out Warby Parker. Warby Parker creates boutique quality eyewear at a revolutionary price point. Prescription glasses starting at only $95, and that's with anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings. For every pair bought, they also donate a pair to someone in need. I love supporting companies that give back like this. I did it, and you can too. Try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy, ships free, and includes a prepaid return shipping label. It was easy and fun. Decide which pair you love, and helpful employees at Warby Parker will take you step-by-step -step through the process of collecting your prescription information and getting your new glasses ordered. I love my Warby Parkers, Ooh. and at this price, you like that? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I even got some prescription sunglasses. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com forward slash crime after crime. Do you wear contacts? Check out their selections, including Scout by Warby Parker, comfortable, breathable, and affordable daily contact lenses. Save money on your next pair of glasses and help others at the same time with Warby Parker. Welcome back, everyone, and please support these great companies that believe in crime after crime. Absolutely. Very big thank you to HelloFresh for coming back this mm -hmm. year. I think you're going to hear more ads from them in the future. We really appreciate having them. And welcome back to Warby Parker also. Mm -hmm. We love these good companies. I, I, I just noticed the FedEx truck passed by as well. And I, it's Monday, so they are delivering my HelloFresh box. <laughs> oh, you know what <laughs> that means? means? Tacos for dinner. <laughs> Tasty tacos for dinner. Pretty excited. Okay. I think it's that time, Danielle. Here we go. Buckle mm -hmm. in. I'm so ready to hear it. He kept giving me yeah. little hints before we started, and my mind is just spinning now. This one, it's it's interesting. It's going to be a little bit different, but few similarities, um, some interesting themes. And considering that for mine, we're jumping in the time machine and heading back almost 100 years, Kind of interesting to, to hear these same themes in both these stories, but here we go. The James Younger Gang, the Dalton Gang, Bonnie and Clyde. Who was the most successful group of historical bank rap robbing, if I could say, <laughs> bank rabbing. <laughs> bank rabbing outlaws. <laughs> bank rabbing outlaws. <laughs> None of them. None of them, Danielle. That distinction goes to a group that many of us are unfamiliar with, a band of outlaws that in a span of five years, from 1919 to 1924, reportedly robbed 87 banks and six trains. I'm thoroughly impressed. Yeah. Yeah. Put that in your Toys R Us, Danielle. That's insane. Danielle. I know. I mean, 40 <laughs> McDonald's robberies. I mean, I'm kind, of, I'm pretty kind good. of impressed, but the trains? 
Yeah, 40 McDonald's. That's a lot of nuggets, but no, we're talking 87 banks <laughs> and six trains. This is a group that wasn't looking for thrills from killing people or even fame from their exploits. They knew the secret to hiding in plain sight and hiding their loot. And maybe just a little too well on hiding their loot, oh, as no. we'll learn in today's story. <laughs> oh, no. I'm talking about the Newton gang and their biggest heist, which includes their biggest fail. To this day, we still don't know the location of the lost Newton loot. Well, buckle up. Here we go. The Newton brothers were sons of poor Texas sharecroppers. Out of 11 children, four brothers, Willis, Willie, who was called Doc, probably because his brother's name was so similar, uh, Joe and Jess all quit school early and started a life of crime in Yolvaldi, Texas. As kids, they would break into stores. Locals began thinking that anytime something seemed to disappear, hmm, must have been those Newton brothers again. <laughs> Way to make a name for themselves. <laughs> Seriously, can you imagine your neighbors assuming that? Just immediately. <laughs> <laughs> At the age of 25, Willis robbed his first bank, making off with $4,700, which equates to over $100,000 in today's money. After joining a heist with some other outlaws in 1916 and getting a cut of an additional $10,000, Willis got caught. At one point, he and his three other criminal brothers were in different jails all at the same time. When they got out, including Doc, who escaped from prison, Willis decided to pull his brothers together into a new family business, the Newton Gang. With his experience, he came up with a few rules that would make the Newton Gang the most successful gang robbers in American history. The key rule he drilled into his brothers that would help them avoid too much focus from law enforcement was don't kill anybody. He knew that bank robbers got one level of attention, but for murderers, it was a whole different game. The brothers added a fifth member in explosives expert Brent Glasscock and started their string of robberies, tearing through the Midwest, hitting banks and occasionally trains. One time, they even decided to hit two banks in one day. Because why not? They were that good. I was about to say, I mean, if you're successful at it, yeah, <laughs> I could see why you just keep on going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they used solid strategies, once again, kind of connecting to your story, spending days analyzing the location of their next hit, aiming for small towns with little security, using explosives to minimize their time there, and moving regularly to avoid detection. Another key strategy was they had acquired a list from a corrupt detective with the Texas Association of Bankers. Oh, so they wow. literally... Yeah, they had a list that told them specifically which banks had older safes, ones that they were comfortable with and, and knew it was easier to blow. G.R. Williamson, an author that sat down with Willis in 1979 to talk about their career, stated, compared to the Newtons, John Dillinger was a two-bit operator. Jesse and Frank James, mere amateurs. Butch Cassidy, small fry. The Newtons made blowing safes and robbing trains a big business. And the rules laid out by Willis seemed to work well. Willis told the author, We wasn't mugs like Bonnie and Clyde. We was just quiet businessmen. What we wanted was the money. He also had an interesting take on the crimes he and his brothers would commit. Quote, I knowed all them bankers was rich and they didn't care about hurting us poor farmers. So why should I care about hurting them? Why shouldn't I steal from them? It's just one thief a stealing from another. Interesting perspective. Yeah, why not? They don't care about us. I don't care about them. Give me your stuff. <laughs> Just give me your money. That's all I want. That's what I'm here for. Hello. <laughs> now, here's where we start seeing their brilliance. They often struck at night when the banks were closed, meaning, once again, no one was dying and no one knew what these guys looked like. Exactly. No big announcement. Hey, this is a stick up, draw, drawing a bunch of attention to them. They didn't leave behind any calling cards or try to taunt the law in any way. And without all that attention, they just didn't have to worry. They were hiding from law enforcement completely in plain sight. In the few occurrences that did happen during the day, it was reported that they were calm and polite and did their best to keep the people they were robbing from getting too upset. It's insane how well this works. 
Seriously. We've seen it in both of our stories now. Like, yeah. I mean, the they're fact, nice. How is that? How is that a thing? <laughs> I mean, I appreciate well, it. I do. I'm like, okay, good. I'd rather you be like that than come in violent and everything. But it's also very alarming at how when that happens, everyone's just like, oh, okay. <laughs> but you're yeah. nice. Well, so, but also consider the mechanism of what's easier to remember. Mm-hmm. Someone comes up to you and screams in your face exactly. and then punches you and runs away versus someone comes up to you and says, I hope you have a nice day. Can you hand me your wallet? Exactly. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you, you know, use my manners. it's, it's going to hit a different part of your memory. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. In between heists, they would head home to Yovaldi. Uh, no one suspected they were a gang of robbers terrorizing the Midwest and even committing robberies as far north as Toronto, Canada. Oh, wow. They're making moves very far. These guys went international. They tried to not be too flashy at home, but would take frequent business trips out of Texas where they would live it up, staying at fancy hotels, eating the best food, and attending sporting events like the Kentucky Derby. When they started getting a little low on cash, they knew it was time to take another trip, hit a few more banks. Of course, much like your friend, Danielle, when you're successful at something, sometimes you start looking at bigger things. And that's seemingly what happened with the Newton gang when they decided to pull the largest train heist ever. After all, they could retire after one big job, right? That's what everyone says. Mm -hmm. I know. Everyone (laughs) says that. It's never true. And they never do. Yeah. (laughs) On top of that, uh, Willis was quoted as saying, I always wanted to do a million dollar job. So they increased their team to eight to pull this one off. They added two Chicago gangsters, a crooked businessman, and a mail inspector. Now, why a mail inspector? The plan was to rob a mail train in Illinois, and they needed the inside information that he had. That train was carrying literally millions And I mean millions back then, not like after the conversion rate to today's money. On June 12th, 1924, once again, working at night, two of the brothers boarded the train, which was headed to Milwaukee. They got to the engineer, took it over, forced it to stop and ejected the mail cargo from it, including cash and bonds. They got a little more forceful than usual, firing bullets and tear gas. However, the only person to get hit by a bullet was their own member, Willie, also known as Doc. Some reports say that their explosives expert, Mr. Glasscock, shot him, thinking he was a security guard. Oh, no. The rest of the gang was waiting where the train stopped with two stolen cars. So they carried Doc off the train. They loaded up the getaway cars with the goods. And while loading up Doc, a bystander overheard one of them say the name Willie. So someone heard that they were talking to him. Hey, Willie, get Willie in here. This would be reported to the authorities. Also reported to the authorities is that the gang made off with $3 million, which equates to approximately $45 million in today's money. That is insane. It's the biggest take for any train robbery in American history. Wow. Yeah. How does no one know more about this? I don't... Well... I'll tell you by the end. There's <laughs> a little like there's a little place. Yeah. Y- you can learn more about it. But yeah, it's it's not super well known. Doc needed medical attention, and this would ultimately help lead to the capture of the gang. The mail inspector accidentally slipped out some details that led to a doctor that was taking care of a man with a gunshot wound who was holding up in a north side Chicago home. One of the brothers, Jess, decided he was going to get while the getting was good. He took a cut, about $35,000, which is still about half a million in today's money, and headed south, planning to jump the border into Mexico. Along the way, however, he thought, why not stop in San Antonio and have a little fun? Oh, no. So Jess starts drinking. And apparently, he wanted to just party it up. He really wanted to tie one on. But he had all this cash. So he hires a taxi driver and asks him, take me to the outskirts of town. He finds a hill. He digs a hole, puts most of the cash in it, except for a few thousand dollars that he kept on him. He then covered up the remaining $33,000 and put a rock on top so he could easily find it again. You know, a rock on a hill that you randomly chose Mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. I can see this working out well. Yeah, it's, it's going to be obvious, right? Yeah. Be easy to find. So he goes back to San Antonio and just blows it out, continues his night of drinking, has a good old time. 
Following morning, he decides it's time to collect his loot and continue his trip to Mexico. Only he realizes, hey, I was probably a little more drunk than I thought the previous night. He couldn't remember where the hill was. Luckily, he was able to track down the taxi driver. But then there was another problem. In a crazy twist of fate, the taxi driver was also drunk and couldn't remember where they had gone. You're joking. No. Could you imagine? (laughs) Oh my gosh, I'm relying on this taxi driver. I was too drunk. I had him drive me out. Oh no, he was drunk too. Yeah. That's a nightmare. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So uh, Jess, he looks for a while, but he can't find the stash and he decides, hey, I got to get to Mexico. You know, things are going bad. So he does jump the border. He eventually gets arrested by a federal agent and is brought back to the U.S. Everyone involved in the heist was captured and sentenced, with the male inspector actually receiving the heaviest sentence of 25 years. It doesn't really surprise me, though. Because, I mean, yeah, like, when you're the one leaking that serious information, I mean, yeah, yeah, people are coming to steal it, but, like, that wouldn't have ever happened if you weren't, I mean, that's male, too. You can't. Mm. Yeah, I think it's the breach of trust. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then, of course, federal level. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and keep in mind, the brothers, despite the fact that they had done all these robberies and all that, it's not like all that has been discovered in this. Yeah. I mean, they're literally just being charged for that train heist. Exactly. And they really, outside of their early criminal life stuff, you know, they don't have a whole lot to look at with their criminal history and say, hey, we need to really lock these guys up. Yeah. So they actually get light sentences all released early on good behavior. Uh, wow. Jess and Joe were out within a year. Willis and Brent Glasscock were in jail for just over four years, and Doc stayed in for six. I think his sentence might have been longer because of his previous prison escape. I think once they saw that, that they wanted to keep him in. But despite their early days of avoiding attention, later in life that would change. In 1975, a documentary would be made about them. In 1980, the youngest brother, Joe, would wind up on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson being interviewed. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. About, and I watched the interview and it's hilarious. Oh, I like just to hear them talking about this. Old, they were really like at the end of the Wild West yeah. and like leading into the new society. Mm-hmm. So it's a weird place where they were kind of this leftover you exactly. know, bank robin, train robin, family of brothers. <laughs> um In 1998, a film called The Newton Boys would be made, starring Matthew McConaughey as Willis and Ethan Hawke as Jess. I heard it wasn't great, but it was all right, all right, all right. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) The Newton gang never shot anyone during their heists, according to them. Although author G.R. Williamson says he found one newspaper account suggesting that one person might have been killed during a heist of theirs. Ultimately, they took in more lot than or loot, not lot. (laughs) Uh, They took in more than Butch Cassidy, the Dalton brothers, and the James gang combined. Wow. As for their take from the train robbery, it's reported that almost all of the three million was recovered, except for about 100,000 of it, including Jess's 33,000 sitting under a rock on a Texas hill hill somewhere. Yeah, just waiting, (laughs) waiting for the taxi driver to come back. (laughs) When the Newton brothers were released, they went looking for it. But as far as we know, it's never been located. And I kind of put that with a little bit of a question mark in it because I'm like, hmm, if they would have found it, would we really know? No. Are they going to be like, oh, we found the?" <laughs> I know. They're definitely not going to be. So I think there's a chance, maybe. I think there's a chance it could have been recovered. Um, special thanks to LoneStarTreasure.com, How Stuff Works, History.com, Mysterious Writings, Wikipedia, The Tonight Show, and LegendsOfAmerica.com. And if we have any listeners in Texas, you want to go looking for it? Jess testified that he hid the money along Fredericksburg Road, but Willis was convinced that the hiding spot was actually closer to Bandera Road. That's interesting. I kind of find that funny. Why, yeah. why would why would Willis be so convinced of that? I, you know, it's hard because looking at this, there was kind of several different versions that I saw yeah. across the different sources, and none of them are super definitive because you're kind of getting like spoken word history exactly, almost yeah. in some of these. So I know that Willis also wound up going to Mexico. Mm-hmm. 
I didn't see anything that they were together. Yeah. But hearing that news, I kind of think maybe they might have been together for part of that trip. Maybe or, they were together or they just like really went deep into searching for it. And then something could be along too. the way kind of led him to really think that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my bet. I'm actually wondering if the taxi driver took it. Ooh. You know, you see, you take someone out there in the middle of the night, you see them go <laughs> bury something in a hill. I feel like human curiosity would get mm -hmm. the best of most people. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that works against it for me is then being there the next day and, you know, being found by him and like, oh, let's go looking for, oh, I was drunk. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it just, if you opened it and you found that much money, like I'd take the next day off. I don't think I'd be driving the taxi around, especially if I thought that guy was still in town. Exactly. Like, and could potentially go back and look for it because that, of course, would lead right back to the taxi driver, which it did. So, yeah, man, it could really be up on that hill under a rock still. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Also, uh, Doc actually tried to rob a bank in his 70s, you know but what? it was... <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's not, that's not the only one. There was other occurrences where the other brothers, like super late in life, decided that they were going to try Let's to do these do things. It, again. <laughs> it was such a lame attempt that they literally let him go with no charges. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's comical. <laughs> They're like, man, just please go home. Yeah, just, just will, will you give it up? <laughs> yeah. Literally begging you at this point. You're 70. Go play some bridge or, you know, I know. find a new pastime. Oh, Do something okay. else. Yeah. All right. So that's it, Danielle. I don't know. Yours is pretty intricate. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There's a lot going on there, a lot of mechanics going on with what this guy was doing and the brilliance level, very, very different. Um, but I don't know. There could be a bag of Ex stolen money. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that's what's so intriguing about your story is because when you think of that, when you think of these hiding places and criminals, you're thinking, oh, yeah, they're going to hide, you know, either the body or the weapon or, you know, themselves so well. They've got to because it's so important. And then to know yeah. that this man quite literally went and dug a hole out in the middle of nowhere and put a rock on it and was like, oh, I'll find this. Yeah. And so that he can <laughs> go back and get drunk. In front of a taxi drunk. driver. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Like with a drunk worst, taxi driver. <laughs> it's the worst idea ever. <laughs> if I ever try to do that, I'm going to be sure to ask my taxi driver, have you been drinking tonight? Can I know. I... <laughs> have you been drinking tonight? I need to know before I go bury this money in, in case I forget. By the way, don't also go and take it. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. We've got some extra stories as usual for the end of the episode. Danielle, let's start it off. This one resonates with me a lot. Not because I would do it. I'm not going to hide. I'm not a criminal. Anyways, moving on from that. 29-year-old Ryan Watt. Watt. I know a lot of people are probably like, wait, what? He violated his ex-girlfriend's restraining order in Petaluma, California. And authorities arrived and an angry Ryan ran in an attempt to escape. Obviously, you have to find somewhere good to hide if you're planning on running from authorities. I feel like most people think run and don't realize you're going to be caught. So luckily for him, it was late September, so he took advantage of the Halloween festivities, and he ran straight to a nearby corn maze and hid from police. The corn maze was covering four acres, you guys. It was huge. It was a huge corn maze, and it took two hours of searching on foot and a helicopter to realize that Ryan wasn't in the maze at all. But the entire time, he had been hiding in a chicken coop on the farm, right outside of the corn maze. I mean, just hanging out with the chickens for over two hours. Uh, now, that's kind of brilliant, too, because you're you're leading to exactly. a place where it's like obvious, like, oh, I could easily hide in here. But then you're not going in there. That's I'm, I'm kind of impressed. I know. Well, I, I want to be impressed. But part of me is like, I wonder if he... Do you know what I'm saying? I wonder if he like didn't think to hide in the corn maze. If he, you know what I'm saying? Like he's like, I wonder if that wasn't actually his intention to throw him off. He just genuinely was like, yeah. oh look, a chicken coop. <laughs> right. And didn't <laughs> just... realize the corn maze was even there. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know. Oh my gosh, they had wow. a whole helicopter out there for two hours. And then I also, <laughs> but it's like he was probably in there going, man, are they ever going to stop searching? Yeah. And I yeah. know chickens. I have chickens. Okay. They harass you. Well, that's that's a good point, too. Yeah. So he's waiting in there through the whole search effort as well. They harass you. Okay. Chickens 
are so they're the most curious animals i feel like a lot of people don't realize this most of them are not scared of you they're not going to run from you like these my chickens come and they love to like attack my boots and like i have (laughs) strings like little strings to tighten the back of my jacket and they'll just like grab on and run and like yank me over nice so dealing Do you have with a that, coop? dealing with that for two hours yeah oh i would never get in there for two hours you're not gonna get in your coop <laughs> absolutely not it's hot there's chicken poop everywhere and they <laughs> will come in and try to figure out what you're doing and it, usually they're pretty small so i feel bad for this guy <laughs> oh <laughs> well you have to send me a picture of now i, I want to see danielle's chicken coop okay, i sure will uh this next story is from santa rosa florida oh florida My we love place. florida this Florida is a friend of this show. <laughs> the headline from policemag.com says it all. Quote, two men arrested after vehicle search finds drugs in bag marked bag full of drugs. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the sheriff's office also wanted to get in on the laughs with their Facebook post where they stated Note to self, do not traffic your illegal narcotics in bags labeled bag full of drugs. Our canines can read. Exactly. <laughs> Take that. I mean, who who would do that? It's like I was uh, saying, you know, these people. Uh, uh, on the YouTube version, I'm showing a picture of it right okay. now so you guys can see. It's no, it's no joke. It's, it's bag full of bag drugs. Full of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Perfect hiding spot. No one's ever going to guess. Well, this one... Also, you know, you wouldn't think actually would be very obvious, but it does involve canines and canines can smell. So investigators Mm -hmm. arrived to a break in at an Oregon rock museum. Now, there was clear evidence that someone had chiseled their way into the building and attempted to get a precious gem. But authorities were finding no sign of the criminal other than that. They took to the woods surrounding the museum with dogs in hopes of finding a trail to follow. And about half a mile away, they were shocked when they noticed a very strange kind of mound of land except the canine then bit the mound of land and it screamed what i I don't think is very normal (laughs) it turned out this was the thief it was 36 year old gregory liascos who disguised himself in a ghillie suit and an attempt to blend in his surroundings after trying to rob this bank Mm. could you imagine like going into the museum and do you think he wore them into the museum like the whole time was wearing the suit I wouldn't think so. I think you store it outside. You go in, try to do the robbery, and then come Hold out and throw it on. For, yeah, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, the ghillie suit, yeah. like it looks like um, almost like the swamp thing. Yeah. You can imagine that. Mm-hmm. It looks like a bunch of weeds. Like it's a whole suit made out of like grass and weeds. So if you lay down in it, you just you look like almost like a lump of hay. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Didn't fool the dog though. The dog said, hmm, "This lump of hay smells funny." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And bit that lump of hay. Exactly. Man. Uh, Yeah. Uh, 20-year-old Milton Hodges had just robbed a Lowe's home improvement store and was on the run. He saw a nearby wall and jumped over, hoping to find the perfect hiding place. Instead, he wound up in a nudist colony. (laughs) (laughs) He wound up stealing a golf cart to help in his escape. But was easily captured by de- by deputies because he was one of the only people wearing clothes. Oh my gosh, that would they be, literally said that that would be my luck if I were to ever <laughs> rob a store and jump a wall, I would jump into a nudist nudist colony. <laughs> yeah, but but the thing is, I mean, let's say that that happens, right? Yeah. Ditch your clothes. Yeah, man, take your clothes off. It's not like anyone there is going to think it's weird. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, Ditch your right, clothes <laughs> and blend in. Don't try to steal a golf cart. Uh, he also had a prior charge for attacking someone with a can of Pepsi. So if we ever do another wackiest weapon episode, watch out because we might hear about Milton again. Man, he doesn't have a lot of good luck. No, and they they from what I saw, they threw the book at him. Like he's he's in jail for a long time. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, who do you guys think is going to win this month? It is up for you guys to vote. I don't know. This is a tough one. I feel like we both had really, really good stories. And I really love the aspect of how hilarious yours is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I love, you know, I'm I'm kind of a technical mindset and stuff like that. So I love hearing about all the mechanisms that are going on in your story about all the things that this guy was creating for himself. But then there's also the, the aspect of... 
which both of our stories have mm-hmm. the criminal that just can't let it go exactly the, the criminal that go. just yeah just has everything set up perfectly and then blows it by just mm-hmm. pushing one time too many or one time too hard it's really yeah i don't know yeah but it's not up to us it's up to you guys who had the best craziest hiding place story you can vote at the Twitter account at Crime After Pod for the first seven days after the episode drops, or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We do have a link in the description box below, but you can still click the little letter I up in the corner and that takes you right to the website as well. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store, where you can find the new Pick Your Winner mug and our new Crime After Crime Jail Tat logo products like the mug Danielle has right there. Of course, we have to thank our patrons always. Patrons always get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly where you get to learn a lot about John and myself. Puts me on the spot a lot. Usually it's hilarious and I dive way too deep into my emotional problems. (laughs) That gives you a little hint on what we did for this next one. Plus, patrons Mm -hmm. get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Yeah. And we also threw out a extra special for Christmas. You guys actually got two specials Mm -hmm. in December. Next up on February 1st, 2021, new episode. And the topic is most absurd defense. It's going to be a good one. There's no telling where that's going to lead us. I just I know I've heard so many in the years of me looking into true crime. I've heard so many lame excuses that, yeah, this could really go all over the place. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Thank you guys so much. This episode is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.